Good day. The situation on the battlefields in Ukraine over the last couple of days has, has been getting quieter, except in two important places. One is in Bakhmut, it's Bakhmut city, this key, important, largish city in the Donetsk region or republic, which the Russians and their allies have been seeking to capture and which many see as the linchpin of Ukrainian defences in Donbass. And in addition, yesterday, over the course of the evening, there was a flare up again of fighting along the Kherson front lines. I'm going to touch on that very quickly. Briefly, there were a number of Ukrainian attacks in all the usual places, all the places which we were discussing about two weeks ago, when the main focus of Ukrainian attacks appeared to be Kherson. There was another attempt to break out of this uh, bridgehead the Ukrainians have uh, developed um, south of the Ingulet River near Ardika. There was fighting uh, near a village called Davidov Brod, further east, where there's a ford. There was some fighting further west. What, can, what one can say is that every one of these Ukrainian attacks was repulsed. The Ukrainians made no gains and suffered losses, significant losses, if you believe Russian accounts, which I generally largely do. I will come to that issue, that vexed, that vexed topic shortly. However, the fighting in Bakhmut is of a much more severe, far more serious nature. It ought to be seen, I think, in conjunction with the fighting that is also taking place near, the, near Donetsk City, as the militia there works systematically to clear the ring road, the Donetsk ring road, and to gradually um, ad push Ukrainian forces away from Donetsk city. And it, it is clear that the primary focus of attention of the Russian political and military leadership of course, of the leaders of the Donbass republics, of the militia, all of these forces, is the eventual encirclement and destruction of the Ukrainian forces in these two important settlements. Bakhmut, a city of around 75,000 people before the war, one which is seen, as I said, by many people as the linchpin of Ukrainian defences in Donbass, and Avdivka, uh, a much smaller place, a kind of big village or large suburb of uh, Donetsk city, if you prefer, but the place where Ukraine has focused, concentrated the greater part of its troops since the start of the conflict in 2014, uh, and from whence most of the shelling of Donetsk city takes place. So this fighting is intensifying and over the course of yesterday we were getting reports that the Wagner group this rather strange mysterious group of people who I'm not really able to discuss exactly what they are I'm not sure whether to call them mercenaries or volunteers but they are a private company though clearly one that shall we say is aligned in its actions with Russian government policy and whose operatives on the ground seem to me to be uh, um, people, retired people drawn from Russian special forces. Anyway, this group, which I suspect is only the spearhead of the attack, seems to be steadily and systematically closing the ring around Bakhmut. Yesterday I got reports, a whole load of reports about a number of places in and around Bakhmut that the Wagner group has supposedly captured, about road links that have been cut. I, I, I'm not going to get into the detail of this. It's If, you, what, if you're interested in that sort of thing, uh, there's plenty of other places you can find it. I, I don't know the exact 
whereabouts of most of these localities. All I will say is that it is clear that the, the, the net around Bakhmut is closing and the net around Avdivka is closing. And we've also had uh, comments from a um, Chechen commander that the Chechen forces are now once more active in the fighting and he says that it's not just the Chechens who are active but that there are increasing numbers of reinforcements pouring in presumably from Russia itself. So the focus on the Donbass um, that we discussed, we've discussed in previous programs, is continuing. By the way, there's been an article in the Financial Times which claims that the withdrawal of Russia's Isium Group somehow compromises the Russian offensive in Donbass. Um, supposedly, the supply line problems are now going to be aggravated. I have to say, I don't see that at all. I suspect, by the way, that in terms of Russian supply lines, that might have been true earlier in the war when the U Ukraine controlled the Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, um, Konobation, and other places in the north of Donbass. But I suspect that since the Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, Konobation came under Russian control, more about that shortly, I suspect that the Russians have developed alternative supply routes which are now functioning normally, which is why they decided, one of the reasons why they decided that they didn't need to hold on to Izium anymore. Anyway, that's my guess, that's my theory of the direction of the war. Now, I just want to say this, and I want to re re reiterate it again. If the Russians or shall we say the Allied forces capture Bakhmut and Avdivka over the next few weeks, then that will have reduced or rather confirmed that the Ukrainian offensive in Kharkov was a sideshow. It was an advance in an area, a marginal area, which has, which has lost its overall significance. But of course, <laughs> before we can say that for certain, that capture of Bakhmut and of Divka needs to happen. I would say that if Bakhmut specifically is captured, then it seems to me that the next stage of the offensive, this slow motion offensive in Donbass will presumably, the next target will presumably be Kramatorsk, where the overall headquarters of the Rush, of the Ukrainian forces in Donbass is apparently located. Um, Kramatorsk is a rather difficult target in some ways because it's on higher ground, but I'm fairly sure that if uh, Kramatorsk is invested, then the rest of Ukrainians, the, the, the remain, remaining part of Ukraine's defences in Donbass will finally and irretrievably collapse. We're not there. We're still some time from that point. We'll see what happens. Anyway, that brings me to discussion of a point which the latest events, the events over the last week, and perhaps over previous weeks, as, as, as the realisation that most of the fighting in Donbass was not being done by the Russian regular army. I, when I say most of the fighting, I should stress, I mean the infantry part of the fighting. Um, that brings me to this question of how many Russian troops are there actually in Ukraine? And... I'm going to say straight away, I don't have a clear answer and no one, no one who is in the know is providing one. 
The Russian Ministry of Defense has never told us at any time how many Russian troops are deployed in Ukraine. Surprisingly, I can't really find much evidence that the Western powers have done. The British Ministry of Defense claims that most of the Russian regular army is in Ukraine. Um, that obviously is not the case. So how many Russian troops are there actually in Ukraine at this particular time? Well, we saw that there were very, very few troops in um, in Izium, perhaps a thousand, perhaps a few more, perhaps a few less, but certainly not a large group of forces in Izium. There are some Russian regular troops in Donbass, and by that again I mean I should stress these are ground, complete ground formations. Somebody um, who is there claimed to me that the total number of Russian troops in Donbass was around 20,000, but he said that some weeks ago, and I don't know, I can't obviously independently verify that figure. So let's start with that figure of 20,000, which is, as I say, conditional. I read that there are something like 20,000 men, Russian regular troops, west of the Dnieper River, defending Kherson region. And then there will also be, there's also certain to be a significant force, a significant Russian force in Zaporozhye uh, region and presumably in southern Donbass, um, up against places like the Ukrainian forces in Ugladar, which is actually in Donetsk region, but also Zaporozhye itself. I'm going to throw a guess that's perhaps another 20,000. Add a few uh, technical personnel, people from Roskvadia. You probably get a figure of around 80,000. And that's in line with an estimate made by Andrei Martyanov, who has the enormous advantage of knowing the Russian military and having a clearer idea of how it works because obviously this is a military with which he is directly familiar. 80,000 men. Now if you, if that figure is anywhere near correct, which I by the way suspect it is, then the Russians have about the same number of troops in Ukraine that the Western powers have at times claimed they have lost in dead and wounded, which I don't for a microsecond believe. But I think 80,000 is perhaps roughly correct. Then of course there is these irregular forces, the Wagner group, the Chechens. Chechen forces, again, difficult to quantify, 10,000, perhaps more. Um, but nobody has given me any figure for how many people there are involved with this Wagner group. And then, of course, there's the question of the militia. And here I had um, suggestions before the war that the militia in total numbers around 100,000 men. But they've now been supplemented by this third army, of which there are estimated very uh, estimates range from 15,000 all the way up to 60,000 i mean i'm not going to even try and guess but the the, poor, the the key point to understand is that the core force that the russian army has in ukraine is likely to be around 80,000 men not the hundreds of thousands that you sometimes hear what about Ukraine? Do they actually have these vast numbers of soldiers that uh, th some people say? And is it really true that it is only territorial defence troops who have been holding the front lines in Donbass and that Ukraine has been saving and building up its 
best professional troops in the rear and that it is these troops who have been engaged in these offences. Well, let's, let's just talk about the offensives at the moment. The offensive that was launched against Hassan region at the beginning, at the end of August and the beginning of September, the forces there numbered around 25,000 men, according to Ukrainian sources. There were apparently another 20,000 in the rear, but these were um, pu made up to a great extent of precisely these territorial forces that we're talking about. But anyway, 25,000 men attacked Kherson region. That's only part of the Ukrainian army. The force that occupied Kharkiv, that engaged in this offensive in Kharkiv region, that numbered around 9,000 men. There's been a lot of talk recently about a Ukrainian build-up in Ugladar in southern Donbass. And recently I got a figure for the number of Ukrainian troops in and around Ugladar, and it was around 2,000. Now, if that figure is correct, I should say that suggestions that this force is intended to launch some kind of offensive against Mariupol uh, seem to me fantastic. It, it, it is not going to be possible for Ukraine to capture Mariupol with an offensive force of just 2,000 men. I suspect that this force in Ugladar is fulfilling a primarily defensive role, though it is not impossible that it is going to engage in some local counterattacks. And then the unresolved question, the mystery, how many troops does Ukraine have in Zaporozhye region? There's been lots of talk and speculation that there's going to be a major Ukrainian offensive in Zaporozhye region. Here I have complete lack of information about the numbers, but such figures as I have seen spoke, speak of forces more deployed more in battalion than brigade levels. In other words, in the hundreds rather than in the thousands or the tens of thousands. Now, a Chechen official, a Chechen uh, military leader, the same one that I mentioned previously, said that in his area of Donbass, which basically is the Solidar area, but it also covers apparently um, other regions of northern Donetsk region, he estimates that the total number of Ukrainian forces located there is somewhere in the re region of 30,000. And let's assume that that also includes Bakhmut, which it probably does. Now, again, I'm not going to even try and give a guesstimate for the totality of the Ukrainian army, but it clearly isn't an army with limitless human resources, manpower resources. We're not talking about an army of hundreds of thousands or millions of men. I mean, I don't think any army has fought a war since perhaps the end of the Chinese Civil War in the 1940s with millions of men going into battle. That's mid 20th century statistics. I don't think that was even true during the Vietnam War, that the United States had something like half a million men at one time in Vietnam. But I don't think that we are talking about figures on anything like that scale in this war in Ukraine, which is being waged at the moment. Moreover, I don't think it is correct that Ukraine has been husbanding all its best troops in the rear and that the fighting in the front lines in Donbass and elsewhere has been um, carried out purely by reservists. Um, the Russian Ministry of Defence provides regular updates on the missile strikes and casualties it claims it is inflicting on Ukrainian military formations.
Now, I've discussed many times that, you know, these casualty figures that the Russian military produce, I mean, I don't know how they calculate or assess them. There's some doubts now, again, starting to appear about how accurate these figures really are. But the point is, when you look at the military units that have been attacked, that the Russian Ministry of Defense says it has attacked, and where you look, and when you look at where the location of these military units is, it, it is absolutely clear that Ukraine has been sending some of its mechanized and armored formations to Donbass, and they have been engaging in much of the fighting there. And by way, by the way, it's also clear that they've been receiving Western weapon systems. Now, at the start of the war, and for many months afterwards, the Russians were clocking up, they still do, by the way, large numbers of tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, armored vehicles that Ukraine had, which they say, which they were saying had been destroyed. And again, there was a great deal of skepticism about this. But the latest film from the battlefields, from Kharkiv, from Kherson, from Donbass itself, to my mind, now provides increasing corroboration for those Russian Ministry of Defence claims. It's increasingly looking as if the greater part of the armoured vehicles used by the Ukrainian mechanised infantry are Western supplied, principally M113s, originally developed by the United States um, in the 1950s, and which somebody once described to me as an aluminium box with tracks. And in fact, um, they don't seem to be faring terribly well on the battlefields. And in addition, when it comes to tanks, it's looking increasingly as if the tanks are T-72s supplied from former Warsaw Pact countries, now NATO member states in Eastern Europe. They seem to have, they seem to be increasingly replacing Ukraine's previous tanks. And we saw those in Kherson region, we've seen these in Kharkiv, we're starting to see them in Donbass as well. Now, a couple of videos ago, I said that there'd been a report that some Leopard 2 tanks had been seen, being used by the Ukrainians south of the Ingulets River. And I speculated that if that was the case, then they were probably operated by Polish troops and had been supplied by Poland. We've seen no evidence of any Leopard 2 tanks since. The West, the German uh, defence minister has said that no NATO country has supplied Western tanks to Ukraine or seems likely to do so. And in light of that, I now think that that report about those Leopard 2 tanks in the operations near the Ingulets River is almost certainly false. So it seems to me that Ukrainian army is certainly not limitless in resources. It probably, it undoubtedly does outnumber the Russian military which, as I said, may be as few as 80,000 men in total. And it has increasingly been re-equipped with Western weapons, T-72s from Eastern Europe, M113s, some other infantry fighting vehicles. There's apparently um, the Russian Ministry of Defense claims that some Bradley vehicles have been destroyed. These are more sophisticated American systems, but presumably supplied by one of the European countries. And also a certain amount of artillery, M777 howitzers, um, Crab, 
self-propelled guns provided by Poland, weapon systems like that. And of course, the famous HIMARS systems and the M270 systems, which are very similar to the HIMARS. So what we've seen is a Ukrainian army, which clearly has suffered losses and is not overwhelmingly huge. And it's gone onto the offensive over the last few weeks. It's tried to launch an offensive before the autumn rain set in and the rivers become serious obstacles. The Oskol River, the Ingulets River, all those Seversky Donets River, um, they start, you know, their levels, their water levels will start to rise. It won't be just possible to ford across them, as has been the case in some places. And um, the ground will start to become softer and more muddy. Anyway, all of that. But they're using the Western supplies to launch these offensives now. And the, the Kharkiv offensive has reoccupied a lot of ground from which the Russians pulled out, but at the risk of, but at the cost of significant losses. And the Kherson offensive has up to this point achieved nothing at the cost of significant losses. And the Ukrainian economy is in an increasingly critical state. And the Russians, without so far even confirming the fact that they've done that, or providing any explanation, by the way, of why they did it, launched these attacks these, these other days on those power stations. Now, I'm not saying that these offensives are Ukraine's last throw. But I did make that comparison in my previous video uh, with the various offensives, this flurry of offensives that Germany launched as it was nearing its defeat in World War II. And I have to say, this does have something of that look about it. But we also come up against the fact that there are only apparently 80,000 Russian troops in Donbass, in, in Ukraine. Far from enough, I would have thought, to occupy the whole country. So what is going on? <laughs> well, I, I have to say, having given all this a great deal of thought, I'm starting to wonder whether the Russian strategy, Putin's strategy, is to just keep the war going at its present level. Maybe they'll have to give up some ground here. Um, maybe they'll be able to gain more important ground somewhere else. They'll, before very long, maybe a couple of weeks, they'll be com presumably confident that Bakhmut and Avdivka and then subsequently Kramatorsk and Slavyansk will be captured and the Donbass will come under their control. But anyway, they'll be able to keep that going at this level, this tempo. They won't have to send large numbers of troops into Ukra in Ukraine. They won't have to accept heavy casualties for the Russian military. They'll be able to keep this going, and they can keep this going indefinitely. They can keep this going indefinitely because this is not an expensive war for them. It's not an expensive war in terms of human losses, which are probably quite low, and their industrial machine has shown that they can keep launching missiles and rockets all over Ukraine, keep artillery strikes going all over Ukraine, and that they can just keep this going for as long as they need, and as long as they want. And in the meantime, Russia's economy is getting stronger. There's only going to be, according to Putin, a 2% GDP contraction this year, um, inflation is falling, prices are falling, uh, output is rising, the shops are full, the uh, houses are warm, the factories are humming. So he, he can continue, he can keep this thing going as long as he can. Whereas Ukraine gradually, 
struggles, its economy is in deepening crisis. It has, it's at serious risk of hyperinflation over the next few weeks, months perhaps. And of course, the Western economies are also in increasingly bad shape. Europe is reeling, is falling into a deepening energy crisis. There's recent figures which show that um, industrial output in the Eurozone is shrinking fast. And of course, we've just had higher inflation numbers in the United States, which for some baffling reason came as a surprise to people. Um, anybody who's been watching my programs and following us on the Duran will know that to me, it was no surprise at all. I've always expected, I've always felt that the movement in inflation in the West continues to be upward. And in the meantime, Russia's international position continues to strengthen. There's going to be an important meeting of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in Samarkand. Iran is likely, well, is certain to join the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Um, Putin is going to be meeting Xi Jinping there, who is apparently coming to Samarkand and will be meeting Putin and having discussions with him. And the relationship with India is looking increasingly solid, as is the relationship with Saudi Arabia. It's, there's even reports now that the Saudis and OPEC Plus are now actually considering an even bigger production cut. <laughs> so, perhaps look to this whole conflict from the perspective of the Kremlin. Putin is saying to himself, everything comes to him who waits. An ambition to occupy the whole of Ukraine, if it ever existed, has obviously been put to one side. Donbass, which is what Putin always talks about, very rarely talks about Ukraine when he talks about this conflict. Donbass will soon be liberated. In the meantime, I can keep going as I am for as long as I need. Sooner or later, the Western powers, Ukraine itself, for all their brave words, will be forced to come to terms. After all, that's what happened in Syria when Putin did do the deal with Erdogan and perhaps that's what Putin ultimately wants and perhaps he doesn't just want a negotiation, a deal on Ukraine, perhaps he wants to revive those two draft treaties that he proposed in December last year, which effectively call, back, call for a pullback of NATO forces to their 1998 positions. In other words, a pullback all the way to Eastern Germany. Maybe that is his, his plan. I don't know this for a fact, but I'm simply setting out what we've gradually got to learn as a result of the activity that we've seen over the last two weeks. The Russians remain focused on Donbass. Even the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense admits as much. They have enough forces in Ukraine to make sure that the Donbass operation is completed successfully, however long it takes. And they also have enough forces in Ukraine to parry any Ukrainian attacks on those places which for the Russians are important. At the same time, they can send missiles and rockets anywhere in the Ukraine that they like. They can disrupt Ukraine's energy system whenever they wish, as they've just shown. And they can simply sit back as Ukraine gets cold, as it perhaps succumbs to hyperinflation, as Europe faces increasing problems as the United States struggles with its own inflation crisis. Now, 
That is logical and it is consistent with Putin's personality. It isn't a strategy, I have to say, without risks, but it is very typical of his rather conservative approach to things. Now, I say all of this because of certain events which have taken place in Moscow over the last couple of hours. In my last video, I said that there had clearly been some kind of an internal debate going on in Moscow about whether perhaps to upgrade the special military operation into some kind of anti-terrorist operation. Well, so far, that doesn't seem to be the case. After some hours of silence, Putin's spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, came out and gave a statement in which he said that mobilization of any kind, whether full or partial, is not for the moment on the agenda. So that doesn't rule out upgrading the operation to a anti-terrorist organization because that would not require mobilization or so it seems to me simply deployment of more troops to Ukraine. But anyway, the tone of Peskov's comments seem to me to suggest that Despite what happened in Kharkov, Putin is content to leave things as they are. And as to those who think that he's under political pressure, well, he's certainly come in for criticism, and that criticism may and will mount if things in Ukraine go badly wrong. But he can point to the fact that his party, United Russia, did extremely well. In fact, they won conclusively in Sunday's local elections in Russia. For what that means, anybody can say, but he doesn't seem to be facing any prospect of popular unrest at the moment. So his position, as he can see it, is solid. Things are going his way. He doesn't need to upgrade the military operation. And something else happened which may, made him, may, may have made him think that sooner or later the Western powers will come round. And that is that he received calls from two important people, or at least important for the moment. One was President Macron of France, the other was Chancellor Scholz of Germany. Now, the conversations with Macron were from the Kremlin readout, rather polite. The conversation with Scholz, by contrast, comes across as extremely fiery. I will read the Kremlin's readout, um, though it is definitely incomplete, and the German readout has been is slightly different and gives an impression of... Um, Schultz threatening Putin over the issue of annexations, but that's not something that this readout, this Kremlin readout, mentions. Anyway, I'm going to read out this uh, readout now, and it's it says the following. This is the Kremlin's readout. The two leaders focused on developments around Ukraine in the context of Russia's special military operation. In particular, Vladimir Putin directed the attention of the Federal Chancellor to Ukraine's flagrant violations of international humanitarian law, the continuous shelling of cities in Donbass, which is killing civilians and inflicting deliberate damage on civilian infrastructure. That is the justification for the special military operation. It is the fact that Ukraine is violating international humanitarian law, is shelling cities in Donbass, is killing civilians. And then he goes on to say, the Kremlin readout goes on to say, the security of the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant was also discussed. The president of Russia described in detail the IAEA coordinated measures to ensure the physical protection of the plant that Ukraine is subjecting to continuous missile attacks despite the serious risk of causing a major disaster. And then it gets 
even worse. During an exchange of views on the implementation of the grain deal concluded in Istanbul on July 22nd, Vladimir Putin emphasized its package character and explained his concerns over the geographic imbalance of Ukrainian maritime shipments of grain, only a negligible share of which goes to the neediest countries. I should say in parenthesis that the European Commission has categorically denied that this is the case, but it is what Putin is insisting on. Anyway, to continue... Moreover, there has been no progress in removing obstacles to Russian food and fertiliser exports. The president confirmed that Russia is ready to deliver large quantities of grain to external markets and to provide needy countries with the fertiliser blocked in European ports at no charge. So if there's a fertiliser crisis, if there's a food crisis... It's the EU's fault. It's not Russia's fault. The EU has said that there, li that there are no sanctions on food and fertiliser. But the reality is that because of European policies, they're not being exported. And then it continues. In response to a question from the federal chancellor, Vladimir Putin noted that unlike Kiev, Russia grants the International Committee of the Red Cross access to prisoners of war. And then, describing the current energy situation in Europe, Vladimir Putin emphasised that Russia has always been and remains a reliable supplier of energy resources and fulfills all of its contractual obligations, while any interruptions, for example, in the operation of Nord Stream 1, are the result of anti-Russia sanctions that interfere with the pipeline's technical maintenance. Considering that gas supply via Ukraine and Poland was stopped by their governments, as well as the refusal to put Nord Stream 2 into operation, the attempts to shift the blame for Europe's energy problems onto Russia look very cynical the leaders agreed to maintain further contact. Now, shift the blame for any Europe's energy problems onto Russia. The attempts to do so look very cynical. Of course, one of the people who's been doing that, to a great extent, is none other than Chancellor Scholz. So what are we to take from all of this? Firstly, it's very interesting that Macron and Scholz telephoned Putin. Uh, one after the other. And again, if you assume, if you believe that that's coincidence, that's just chance, it clearly isn't. The Kremlin readout doesn't actually say that it was Schultz who initiated the call, but all the indications are that it was. And the Kremlin readout of the call with Macron makes it absolutely clear, it says straightforwardly, that it was Macron who initiated the call. So, these two European leaders have telephoned Putin at this time. Why? I think there's two straightforward reasons. They are getting increasingly worried by the developing economic crisis. And they're anxious now to try to reopen some kind of conversation with Putin. One suspects that after the events in Kharkiv, about which, of course, Scholz and Macron are well informed and about which they might have been well informed in advance, perhaps after the events in Kharkiv, they were expecting to find Putin in an accommodating mood, looking for some sort of off-ramp. But the readout of the conversation with Scholz strongly suggests otherwise. It is Putin taking a firm stand on every issue. What will Putin make of these calls? I can't help but think that he will be saying to himself, the fact that these two people are calling me after weeks of silence, after weeks of abuse, is a sign that, on the contrary, it is they who are now looking for an off-ramp. 
So what will I do? I will keep going just as I am until they finally come round. It is a very high risk strategy. Some will say, many will say that it's also a cynical strategy. It prolongs a war in which people are dying when perhaps a stronger intervention by Russia might bring it to an end and that might be better from a humanitarian perspective, end the war quickly rather than prolong it. I leave that to others to say. It also, of course, leaves open the possibility of Western escalation, of the West in desperation, if they really have their backs to the wall, coming up and doing something radical or risky, supplying Ukraine with weapon systems that they've up to now not shown any willingness to supply, or perhaps even sending Western troops there. And then there is, of course, another risk, which is that somehow or other, in some way or other, the Western powers will get over these problems, that they'll find some solution to their energy problems. Or, if they don't, even if their populations suffer hideously, they will nonetheless keep going and keep going until eventually it's Russia that gets worn down. But one can see why Putin may be thinking like this. He cannot be unaware of the fact that Western arms supplies to Ukraine are now starting to run down. Um, we're now getting reports that the main military support to Ukraine that's going to be provided by the Western powers from this point onwards is going to be training rather than weapons. That was actually said by a number of Western officials. The Western weapon systems that Ukraine has been given, this rather strange mix of weapons from various Western states, some of it's proved effective, much of it has not. The T-72s are a known quantity. The Russians can deal with them. The M-113s are far inferior to the infantry fighting vehicles and armoured personnel carriers that Ukraine produced for itself and had before the war. And the artillery, well, the artillery that's been supplied is in limited quantity with limited amounts of ammunition and is less than what Ukraine had at the start of the war. So one could see that Putin might be saying to himself, at the moment, things are going my way. I don't have to change my schedule. I don't have to change my plans. I can let this thing go on as long as it needs to. Bakhmut will soon fall. Avtivka will follow. Donbass will be cleared. Doesn't look as if her song is going to be recaptured by Ukraine anytime soon. Sooner or later, the Western powers will come to terms. From my point of view, from Putin's point of view, he may be saying something else as well he may be saying to himself that it is more in his interests and perhaps in Russia's interests to end this war with a negotiation and a settlement rather than simply march in and occupy the whole of Ukraine after Ukraine has been completely defeated. Um, because he will then be left with Ukraine which he will, be, he will need to rebuild. But of course, the underlying problems in Europe, of Russia's position in Europe, will be left unresolved. NATO will still be there. US forces will still be there. All of those problems will still be there. Whereas if he can sort out the problem of Ukraine within a global deal, well, he will have achieved that which he was talking about this time last year, a settlement of the problems on Russia's western flank, which will give Russia the time and space it needs to press ahead with its own development. 
That was what he said in a foreign ministry board meeting, as I very well remember, about a year ago. The event that in some ways triggered this whole sequence of events, which we have seen now. And for all I know, that is still the objective he is following. Well, if I am right, then it seems to me that it becomes even more important to do this deal now. Because it doesn't look as if Putin is going to give up or change course. The war will go on. People will die. Donbass, I am sure, will be taken over eventually by the Russians. And if Macron and Scholz think that just coming along and reopening communication lines with Putin in the expectation that at the moment he's in a mood to negotiate and compromise and give up on his plans and look is looking for a rough off ramp well that is wrong as well i said in a previous video i've said also in a program i did with alex christoforu on the duran that from ukraine's point of view this is perhaps the best moment to open negotiations with Russia, to end the war. Things are not going to go continue getting better. This Things could start getting much worse from this point. In fact, they're very likely to do so. They're likely to lose Bakhmut and Donbass. They may be going to lose a lot more. Their economy, as I said, is in a very bad shape. They've got to come up with a solution. Will they do it? Will Schultz and Macron, who undoubtedly are going to be speaking with each other, draw what I would have thought are the rational conclusions? That remains to be seen. But the facts speak for themselves. The inflation numbers are rising in the US. The output levels in Europe are falling. The temperatures are starting to drop. We'll see what they do. Anyway, that's my program for the day. It's been a long program, covered a lot of ground. Um, some ways a retrospective program, looking back at some of the events of the last few weeks. Obviously, it's a fluid situation. More may happen very soon. But anyway, Thank you for joining me again today. And remember, you can find my videos and Alex Christofori's videos and Duran videos on other platforms, Locals, Rumble, um, um, BitChute, Odyssey and Telegram. And also, please remember that you can um, support us via Patreon and subscribe star by going to our shop and buying all the things that you will see there are magic mugs our hats our hoodies our t-shirts our sweatshirts and all the rest and last but not least if you've liked this video please remember to press the like button and to check your subscription to this channel thank you for joining me again today more from me soon